While we're here tonight to hear Justin's story, a real goal of the series is also to bring together creative and entrepreneurial folks to, to meet each other and to collaborate. So I hope that you will stick around um, at the end of the talk and get beers and hear live music in the hall. Um, Okay, and just a little preview of what's coming up in the next Creative Somerville series. We've got some great speakers. Um, Jesse Banzel, who's CEO and founder of Green City Growers, which is a garden installation and maintenance company. And then by uh, popular request of the Creative Somerville series, we have Aaron Cohen, who founded uh, Gracie's Ice Cream. So, and he's, it's wildly popular and delicious. Um, and finally, we wanted to say thank you to Somerville Local First, uh, for being our co-sponsor, for uh, SCA TV for being here as well, and then to Aeronaut Brewing Company for hosting us and um, making it so that we can have delicious drinks while we hear Justin's story. So now I'm excited to introduce Justin. So Justin King is the founder of, and executive director of City Awake, um, a nonprofit organization focused on building the ecosystem of civic engagement and social innovation throughout greater Boston. Justin started his career as an associate at Mass Challenge, where he remains the industry champion for the social impact track. Um, and he has worked in the startup world as well. And he jokes that he got his MBA and MPA through the School of Life, um, AKA work. Um, community building and organizing have been central to his career. Um, and he uh, worked as an organizer for Opportunity Nation, um, and is a big brother and is also on the New Leaders Council. Um, he's a Brandeis grad and he's gonna show us a little bit of the story behind the story. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you uh, for hosting me today. Uh, I think it's uh, first time, you, uh, it's amazing you didn't actually just read my bio. So thank you for being creative and uh, speaking and innovating and uh, improving there. Uh, so I'm gonna walk you through my history, uh, which started at Mass Challenge. So those who aren't familiar with Mass Challenge, Mass Challenge is the largest global accelerator in the world. And it was sort of one of the impetus of creating this innovation economy across greater Boston. Now, this is sort of embarrassing. This is actually the cold email that I wrote six, seven years ago uh, to the CEO, uh, very embarrassingly asking for a job. So uh, if you don't mind reading a little bit of it, um, and I will cringe why I say that. Uh, to whom it may concern, hope all is well. My name is Justin King. I'm a recent graduate from Brandeis University, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, please hire me. Um, and, and what happened was that they actually did. And what happened was it gave me a great first-hand witness point of view of understanding why ecosystems are important. Um, now, when I worked at Mass Challenge, it was in 2009. In 2009, uh, it was the recession. It was a hard time to find a job. I was lucked out in finding a job at Mass Challenge as an associate as their first time, first hire uh, that was a non-founder. Now, how many people work at startups or an entrepreneur or in the tech ecosystem? A couple of you. Now, before 2009, uh, the innovation economy uh, was very centralized to Kendall Square and MIT. So what that meant was if you wanted to be an entrepreneur, uh, you would have to be an MIT engineer. So for some reason in 2009, an explosion of activity occurred. Uh, accelerators uh, launched there, including Mass Challenge, Techstars, Media outlets like Boston O, Beta Boston, Boston Business Journal started covering technology. Every university and college started creating an innovation center. It's mind blowing to think, but it was only about six years ago that Harvard actually created an innovation center. So when you're talking about Harvard, which you think is at the forefront of many things, it was only seven years ago when they said, hey, let's invest in the innovation economy. Uh, so these are some of the examples, co-working spaces, media outlets, accelerators, incubators, talent education programs that started in 2009. Now, seven years later, if you ask anybody to describe the technology sector, they would say it's much more inclusive, more welcoming, more accessible, more grassroots. And uh, not only did it shift culturally, it actually moved the needle. Uh, so in 2014 to 2013, there was a billion dollars more invested in Boston-based startups. Mayor Walsh, who's a guy from Dorchester, no technology background, invest, uh, announced seven tech-related initiatives last year, including hiring a full-time startup czar. Um, we had uh, three major IPOs ending an 18-month drought of technology IPOs in Greater Boston. So in the span of seven years, uh, right before 2009, it was all about Kendall Square, MIT. Seven years later, we have the Innovation District, Fenway, now we have the Rockbury Innovation Center, Somerville just created Greentown Labs and this whole area. 
uh, it has become very trendy and popular. Even the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce has recently hired a VP of Innovation Leadership. And to that point, again, increased capital, stronger organization, more political will, and more jobs. So in 2013, Massachusetts became the highest concentration of technology jobs beating out California. So the question, especially if you're someone in urban development or economic development, things can change very rapidly. So in seven years, uh, we looked at, again, this tremendous activity, uh, what the Mass CLC, the Technology Association in Boston has described as an explosion of activity. Now, my background has always been in the realm of social consciousness. Um, in Brandeis, uh, a few people would refer to me as uh, in the entrepreneurship space, but my background is very much as an activist uh, at Brandeis University. I would march in protests and, and do such things as that. But what piqued my interest while working at Mass Challenge and understanding these ecosystem building efforts is how do we replicate this for the social impact sphere, right? Right now, if you're Anyone actually run a nonprofit or start a social enterprise or anything like that? No, okay, well hopefully one day. Uh, so what happens is right now, if you wanna start a nonprofit or a social enterprise, it's like cute, good luck, that's adorable, right? Or even if you wanna have a career in nonprofits or in a mission-driven company, it's like, oh, that's adorable, let me know when you have a real job. Uh, but the difference is, is if you're starting a technology company, you know, if you're a tech entrepreneur, there's like 80 different programs that can help you operate and scale those efforts. So the question is, how do we legitimize the impact economy as much as the in innovation economy? And our bet is in five, 10 years, as much there has been efforts around building this innovation economy, the next trendy thing will be around impact. So every company is all about being innovative. Every student wants to be the next entrepreneur. We think it's gonna be all about being impactful in every industry. And the proof is already in the pudding. Uh, I hope that's a phrase. I hope I didn't just make that up. Uh, is that a phrase? Sorry, I'm a, I'm a born and raised immigrant family, so I always get uh, cultural uh, things like that always wrong. Uh, but it's already happening right now. So our bet is really based on two things. One is a generational shift that's happening. People in their 30s, 20s, and younger want to complement their uh, paycheck with purpose, and I believe a lot of people in this room probably empathize with that. The second thing we're noticing is an industry shift. Nonprofits are no longer the exclusive providers of social change. Nonprofits will always be an important part but they only account for, let's say, 10% of the industry. Uh, what we're witnessing is examples really based here locally, such as Bain Capital. Bain Capital, as you're familiar with, if you, you know, follow Mitt Romney, uh, is one of the premier private equity funds in the country. They recently hired Governor Deval Patrick to, uh, to lead their impact investing fund. Governor Patrick, who could have done anything, he could have ran for president if he was silly enough to do that, instead he decides to create a triple bottom line investment fund with the one of the most prestigious uh, private equity funds out there. Uh, Mintz Levin, which is one of the top tier law firms in the city and across the country, they're actually our pro bono lawyers, they actually coincidentally, independent of us, have created a social innovation practice within their actual law firm. So they have clean tech, they have healthcare, and now they have social innovation. And then you have a tech company like Artlifting. Artlifting sells homeless people's artwork in our online marketplace, um, and then uh, gives these homeless artists jobs, wages, et cetera and they just raised about $1.1 million a few months ago. So in the spheres of technology, and finance, and law, and real estate, and art, and everything, you're seeing this transformation about, um, you know, let's not just make money, but let's also do good. And I challenge you, if you go to any career section of any big company right now, uh, you'll see them trying to entice people to work there by saying, you know, we have high, high salaries, et cetera, uh, but we're environmentally responsible. Uh, we actually care about our community, et cetera. So this thing, what it, most people have thought as a fad, we expect to be a trend and then an actual economy. Um, and Vanessa Kirsch, who's the CEO of New Profit, which is a venture philanthropy fund, um, sort of said it really, really nicely a couple years ago, basically comparing Boston as the Silicon Valley for the social sector. So while we think that every city wants to be the next Silicon Valley, it's on Boston, Somerville, Cambridge to make us a unique place and not just try to replicate the successes of other entrepreneurial hubs. Do I just keep talking? Cool, okay, sorry, lots of talking. All right, uh, so for City Awake, we've done a few things, but the two things that I think want to share with you this, to, this year um, to make Boston sort of the epicenter of social impact, the Unreasonable Institute uh, is the premier social enterprise accelerator in the world. Uh, they're based in Boulder, East Africa, Mexico. It's a five-week program training global entrepreneurs tackling poverty, environment, healthcare, et cetera. 
uh, we helped convince them to relocate here in the fall of 2016. So again, for us, a lot of times that what we do is not trying to recreate the wheel and start our own accelerator because I'm not stupid enough to do that. We try to find best in class things across the world and have them come here to Boston. Uh, a second example is called the Collaborative. The Collaborative is uh, uh, the Collaborative and Classy Awards. Uh, is one of the biggest social innovation conferences in the world. Last year, Richard Branson went, the uh, Clinton Foundation, Oxfam, et cetera. They're based in San Diego. Uh, and they realized their conference, which hosts about 2,700 people, uh, was San Diego's nice. I'm sure I, I apologize for anyone from San Diego. But again, San Diego didn't, wasn't the right atmosphere to grow this conference. Uh, Boston, unfortunately, lacked a flagship conference around social innovation. So they were looking at DC, New York, San, uh, Seattle, and Boston. And we at City Awake helped convince them to move here in Boston and we're acting as their local partner as well. So those are two initiatives of many initiatives for us to begin thinking through, how do we legitimize this? How do we actually make this into an own economy? And ultimately our vision one day is, you know, if someone's like, oh, congrats on your new job, how much money do you make? Or if someone was rude enough to ask you that, uh, but also say like, how much impact are you making? We think that's just gonna be as important uh, as uh, making money in, in, the, in the next generation. So Justin, what we are hearing in your stories, this interest in talent development, thanks, this interest in um, this interest in social impact work, an interest in economy building, organizing. What can you take us back and tell us about your background and what what led you to be doing the things that you're doing today? That's a great question. Uh, a lot of you know, for me, it started off uh, again at Brandeis. At Brandeis. Um, and I think uh, hopefully many of you all, I was a troublemaker up until the point of college. Uh, and that includes like when I was younger, I would like steal stuff from toy stores when I was in middle school, et cetera. Uh, Brandeis has a unique culture where it really promotes social justice. It's the only school where the three women that ever appeared on the FBI's top 10 most wanted, they went to Brandeis. So that includes uh, Angela Davis and some women from the uh, Weatherman Underground, some things back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, so Brandeis really cultivated me into harnessing my uh, troublemaking atmosphere uh, attributes into more uh, positive social attributes. So uh, at Brandeis, I started understanding uh, traditional activism. And it was that point where I understood sort of traditional activism when I went to my job at Mass Challenge. And I didn't even know what an entrepreneur was when I graduated college. It was sort of this foreign concept to me. I applied to this job at Mass Challenge just because it was a recession, I was 22, I had no marketable skills, I was a history major, uh, so there wasn't really hope for me. So I emailed Math Challenge, it worked out. And, and again, it was that particular experience that it made me understand um, all this stuff, entrepreneurs is, is a community-wide exercise, right? An entrepreneur can't scale if there is no talent to help them. An entrepreneur can't scale if there's no capital invested in them. They can't scale if there isn't a good real estate market. They can't scale if there's not good universities to produce research, right? Uh, so for us, you know, for me, considering just my background in traditional activism was like, how do we support uh, the social innovators? Because if you ask around, there's just very limited resources here across Boston. And oftentimes, again, it's very much diminished as like, oh, that's a nice sort of thing to do on the side. Uh, but what we're recognizing, and it's starting to, similar to 2009, uh, capturing the same energy where, um, again, Bain Capital, Mintz Levin, Art Lifting, these big institutions are recognizing social impact as the next frontier as innovation was seven years ago. Okay, so you've spoken to me about this concept of getting your, your graduate degrees through jobs, right? You've had a number of jobs that gave you your public policy degree and your business degree, your MBA. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how, what you picked up along the way? Do you recommend that rather than going to grad school? And then along the way, did you, did you set out with a plan of this is what I'm gonna do in this order or did it evolve over time? Uh, so uh, disclosure, I was a terrible student, not surprisingly at every part of my life. And at Brandeis, uh, for me, I intentionally try to miss one day of school every day. Uh, one class thing, so I would like, you know, I would wake up and say, ah, you know, today, uh, you know, South Asian history sounds boring, and the next day would be Renaissance or whatever. Um, so I realized grad school would be a very challenging for, thing for me, and actually, uh, at Brandeis, I actually started four nonprofits. So I just always had this energy of just like ex experiential learning was always my sort of MO. And, you know, those four nonprofits, it was very traditional millennial energy. I was like, 
oh, you know, poverty sucks, let me try something. Or like, oh, this Israel-Palestinian conflict, that sucks, let me try to do something there. And they were all pretty relatively successful that I raised about uh, $250,000 over the course of two years, and like they're all program ready, et cetera. And one of them actually I could have um, gone with and probably had a salary for a little bit after college. Uh, but I recognized like, slow down, Justin, like you don't know anything. So uh, once I graduated college, I made an intentional effort of um, you know, harnessing my energy and just being patient and just trying to learn as much as possible. Uh, knowing that grad school wasn't always in the cards, uh, just because it would be very challenging for me to be in a classroom, uh, I took the approach of trying to find great mentorship. So my first two years out of college, I worked at Mass Challenge and the Unreasonable Institute. Uh, both of them are business accelerators, so I consider that sort of this pre-MBA where I was exposed to uh, literally hundreds of startups and got to witness the ups and downs of these different businesses. Um, I recognize, though, business isn't live in a vacuum, so I wanted more policy experience. Uh, so I went to a nonprofit called Opportunity Nation, which at, uh, advocates for economic mobility solutions nationally, uh, very policy focused, and I took a job as their lead national organizer. So what that meant was I would go to different states where there were key U.S. senators that were on uh, important committees to pass the legislation. So I would go to North Carolina, Florida, Ohio, um, uh, states like that, build, do rallies, town halls, et cetera, to build local op-eds to drum up support. Uh, and I sort of, in that two and a half years, I sort of understood again how policy works. And that was a very direct learning experience. I then realized that working in federal government is a terrible thing. Um, and I can talk uh, at length about that. Uh, but I realized that policy, that policy experience is very helpful. Uh, so then I reassessed what was I missing uh, even though I advised startups for about two years, I never actually worked in a startup. So uh, for the last two years, I worked at a tech startup called Yesware um, as a customer success manager. And the great part of that was uh, I would punch my former self, because I remember as an advisor to these startups in my early days, I'd be like, oh, it's easy, like just do this and X, Y, Z. I don't know if any of you work at startups, but it's night and day, right? I, you know, it, you can't really truly empathize of running a startup until you actually do or work within one. So while working at Yesware, this was an incredibly important experience for me to understand the ups and downs, how to build the company from 20 people to 100 people, et cetera. Um, while at Yesware, I started City Awake as a volunteer project, and then it just sort of went you know, beyond my expectations where we raised uh, significant money for me to move transition full time. But it was that sort of narrative where I wanted the well-rounded experience of business and policy, and I still don't feel like I'm ready to be a CEO or an executive director, to be humble and honest about that. Um, I feel it every day, but it's the most prepared that I could be at that. And it's only because I had that direct practical experience and excellent mentors on the way. Okay, so tell us about that moment where you were moving into doing City Awake full time. Was it a jump? Did it feel like a jump? What were you thinking at the time? So City Wake is only 15 months old, and you know I still—it's been a crazy experience because I—you know—the first thing that City Wake ever did was a festival. Uh, we wanted to do something fun and see, you know, uh, John Harthorn, who runs Mass Challenge. I used to ask him, "Why did you create an accelerator?" And he used to say, uh, "It's a uh, artificial way to bring the community together. Accelerators have a way to get investors, entrepreneurs, government officials, talent, etc." Uh, so for me, in my humble, I was just like, oh, I'm not going to run an accelerator because I, no one should listen to me as a CEO. Uh, so we were like, what's another thing that can convene people? And that was the festival. And as a volunteer team, under a $5,000 budget, we did a festival, 99 events, 233 partners, 10,000 attendees, uh, in the man matter of like three months of planning. And I give kudos to my team, but at the same time, I think it was just, again, the community was resonating with what we were preaching. Um, and then over the last 12 months, we were just doing all these different side projects to just keep building up our brand. Uh, the big transition point, and you know, people in from the early days were like, Justin, you gotta make this your full-time thing, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, I don't know what this is. Like, I don't wanna run a festival. Like, there's like so many different things like I have to think through. Like, I don't wanna be in the same position where I started four nonprofits in like the Israel-Palestinian territories and be like, oh, you know, I'm gonna shut this down. Uh, so ultimately, you know, it took to a point about 12 months where someone was like, here's $100,000, just do and run with it, we trust you. Uh, you've had this much success with very little resources, we're gonna give you some finances and just run with it and go from there. So truthfully, I had to be pushed into situations to take the leap. 
Um, because ultimately, it was never my intention to make City Awake my full-time thing. But ultimately, you know, you know, and our philosophy is just keep providing value as much as possible. And we've been in a situation to keep raising more money, keep doing cool things, and create more partnerships. And the truth is, the last three months we've been in the hibernation phase, just because moving full-time was a very fast experience. So the last three months, we've intentionally done nothing. Uh, so we've been taking a step back, plotting and planning, and doing our whole theory of change, and we're very excited for the next nine months of what we have coming up in the year. Okay, so tell us about a couple of lessons that you learned from the early days. Uh, a few things. Uh, one is, um, when we first started City Awake, and City Awake, while I'm full-time and actually hired my first full-time paid contractor, um, it's very much volunteer-driven. So the first thing is, if you're organizing a volunteer team, um, uh, set very high expectations. Uh, when I started City Awake, uh, we had a bunch of volunteers, and I was like, uh, come help me out. We're never going to have any meetings at all. You know, that was my pitch to them. I was like, I just need your help. It's going to be like really cool, really easy, like just do whatever you want. And we had no meetings at all. Uh, then it evolved to like, okay, you guys, how about we do like a, you know, every week we have a Skype call or something like that. Um, and then eventually evolved into, and now what we do every Monday is we meet from 6 to 8.30 p.m. in person on Monday. So one of the most valuable experiences, especially when mobilizing people, it's around, um, again, um, c creating clear expectations for volunteers or possibly volunteer founders or an engineer you're trying to recruit. Like at all these situations, you want to create the right expectations so that no one is left behind and feel like uh, there was some miscommunication. The second thing whenever you're starting a startup, I, uh, starting a startup uh, is uh, act bigger than you are. And this might be come off as phony, uh, but in every experience that I've ever been is that, uh, so for Mass Challenge, this global brand now, one of the most popular companies in, in Boston. Uh, when we started, it was like there was nothing. You know, I was their first associate, like it was like nothing at all. But John, the CEO, and the rest of the founders would go to every meeting saying, Mass Challenge is the largest accelerator in the world. And at that point, that was an absolute lie, you know. But they kept selling it, they changed the vision, they convinced people, and they had such a hard time getting meetings in the beginning compared to what they can do now. But in the beginning, it was because of that enthusiasm, that vision, et cetera. Uh, even for Unreasonable, for Opportunity Nation, every job that I had, all the founders that I worked with always put it at a, at a lot, the, the vision more than actually the practical product. So even for City Awake, when we pitched our first inaugural festival, I would be like, uh, you know, this, it's going to be a huge festival and we have, it's going to be 100 partners, et cetera. And I would tell that to people, and we didn't even have one partner yet, but I said it's 100 partners, et cetera. And luckily we got to a point where we had 200, nearly 250. Uh, but at this point, especially when you're selling, uh, vision and that sort of you know ambition is very important in terms of starting a company. Okay, so um, now tell us about the worst day that you've had since since going over to City Lake full time. Uh, no bad days. Things have been good. It's been like this really nice honeymoon phase right now. Uh, and this is, again, I'll be completely honest, like, people love young, not to say I'm charismatic, but like young, charismatic CEOs or entrepreneurs. Uh, so at this time, like, for me to recognize, like, not to believe too much of my own hype and, like, take these meetings with all humility and not try to think that I know everything that I do uh, and know that in two years they're going to be like, Justin, you're in your 30 now, 30s now, like, I'm not going to pay attention to you. Uh, so right now things have been going uh, pretty well. Uh, the situation actually right now, I'm actually having a challenge. Uh, because right now, uh, City Awake has uh, three different ways to go moving forward. Um, three very exciting different ways. And we're at a situation where I need to probably pick in the next week or two. Um, and it's sort of giving me some decision par paralysis. So uh, the biggest challenge is like, especially as an entrepreneur, uh, being restrained. It's, you know, for me, even for City Awake, people are like, in the first month, like, you should expand this to other cities. Uh, what I learned is that I really appreciate the entrepreneurs that can be restrained not be too like, you know, excited by every possibility and people being like, oh, you should do this with us in every partnership. Uh, so I've been, I think the most challenging thing is just, you know, uh, sitting on your hands and just measuring every opportunity as realistically as possible. Yeah, okay, so tell us, um, you hired your first person, that's, that's kind of a big deal. Um, where, where do you see City Awake going in the next couple months? if you can answer that without answering your big decision. 
very excited about City Awake. Uh, you know, just strategically, a lot of our programming in the past has been very just one-off events or one-off programs. Like it's like for five days or one day or ten days and it's done. Uh, we're going to create much more cohesive programming throughout the year. Um, and then, the, I mean, you know, to be transparent, you know, uh, we're, right now uh, there's a couple big organizations, big nonprofits in Boston that want to acquire us. Uh, so that's what we're talking through. Uh, so these big mammoth. Uh, institutional established organizations that uh, are very like influential but also not forward thinking uh, have approached us to go under their umbrella um, and that comes with finances and pro like just all the bells and whistles but obviously the challenges there is that um, culture clash autonomy brand equity uh, so the big decision right now is uh, if we take any of these offers Okay, and then one last question before we open it up. Um, how do you think uh, City Away can help you grow? If, if this is yet another chapter in your, in your self-education, how have you grown in the past couple of months? Yeah, I, I, I think a lot. Um, I've been very, you know, it's a very vulnerable thing to be a founder. It's like the scariest thing that you ever can do because you're basically opening up yourself saying like, hey world, like I have this idea, like don't laugh at me. Um, so for me, especially, I'm a INTJ, uh, which means that, gosh, it means that like I don't like talking about stuff. Uh, so for me, it's been a very good experience of, you know, putting myself out there, sharing my ambition, sharing my vision, and asking people for help. Uh, so I think just ultimately this whole experience has been, you know, just made me that much smarter, more humble, more everything that I really appreciate uh, people who take a risk. And for me, I hired this first full-time person because I'm not ready to actually have a full-time employee. Like it scares the heck out of me to actually hire someone full-time and be in charge of their livelihood. So these are things that just like that, um, you know, as an entrepreneur and, you know, right now everyone wants to be an entrepreneur, but like that I take very seriously and like, you know, I think through every day nervously. Thank you so much for being here, opening up. Um, I want to invite everybody to stick around, get a beer. They're really, really tasty. Um, get Justin a beer for being awesome. Um, meet each other. We have somebody in the audience here who um, is an anthropologist. We've got somebody who is a new father. We have somebody who tried kombucha for the first time within the last calendar year. Um, so if you want to know who these people are, Ask them questions. Find out what their righteous cause is. Um, get to know each other. It's a very cool community. Thanks for thanks for being here with us tonight, and thank you, Aeronaut, for hosting and for everybody who makes this possible. Good night.